This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. The saga of Noah's Ark, one of the Bible's most enduring stories, is now the focus of a tantalizing debate. Was there truly a great flood which Noah, following the instructions of God, managed to survive? In recent years, two research expeditions have combed the mountains of Ararat and Turkey. Incredibly, both believe they may have found the remnants of Noah's Ark in two separate locations. In Austin, Texas, three men noticed a strange car cruising their neighborhood. Moments later, they heard the desperate screams of a woman, and they were caught up in the search for a brutal kidnapper. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. One of the most famous and evocative of all Bible stories. As recorded in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God looked down upon the earth he had created and saw to become evil and wicked. He came to a righteous man named Noah and ordered him to build an ark. And God said to Noah, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. And so it came to pass. God brought forth a great flood. Forty days and forty nights, rain descended from the heavens. All living things were destroyed, save for the occupants of the ark. When the waters receded, God said to Noah, Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply. So ends the story of Noah's Ark. But for centuries, people have wondered, was the story based on fact, or was it a legend handed down from generation to generation as a symbolic morality play in a hostile and corrupt world? Contrary to popular belief, the Bible was not the original telling of the story of Noah and the Great Flood. In ancient Babylonia and Samaria, the same story was recorded thousands of years before the Bible was written. Even here in North America, the early Spanish explorers were startled to discover the Hopi Indians told a tale that was remarkably similar to the story of Noah's Ark. In fact, no fewer than 200 variations of the legend can be found in cultures throughout the world, leading many to believe that there was indeed a cataclysmic flood thousands of years ago. In recent times, some researchers have seized upon this speculation and gone in search of definitive proof, the remains of Noah's Ark. According to Middle Eastern versions of the story, the Ark was built near the ancient city of Sherapak in what is now Iraq, in the book of Genesis, chapter 8, the Bible says the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which are in present-day Turkey, more than 500 miles from Shurapak. 
It is a desolate, sparsely populated region, rising above the headwaters of the Tigris River. In recent years, several separate research expeditions have explored the mountains of Ararat. Incredibly, two separate teams both believe they may have found the Ark in two different locations, 17 miles apart. One of the sites lies on the northeast side of Mount Ararat, under a permanent 23-square-mile glacier. In 1969, a Turkish businessman named George Hagobian went public with a remarkable story. He claimed that as a young boy in 1906, he had actually seen Noah's Ark wedged in a glacier from which the ice had temporarily receded. Hagobian described the vessel to archaeological illustrator Alfred Lee. He said it looked like a long box, it's rectangular, and the, the corners were kind of rounded a little bit. The, the sides sloped in slightly. The roof, he said, was basically flat with just a slight pitch to it. And there was a stair kind of a apparatus at one end. His uncle hoisted him up onto this ladder and he walked on up onto the roof. And there, all the way down the middle of the roof, he saw these holes. And he stuck his head in and it was dark. He shouted and his voice echoed and re-echoed inside. It was hollow. George Agopian went back a couple years later, saw the same thing, but ice and snow were beginning to cover it up again. 17 years later, Alfred Lee was introduced to a man named Ed Davis, who in 1943 was stationed in Iran with the U.S. Army. He, too, claimed he had seen the Ark. When Ed Davis started talking, the hair on the back of my head just stood up because I could, like, hear an echo of George Agopian from years before. Ed Davis's sighting occurred in roughly the same area as George Hagobian's. However, when Davis saw what he thought was the Ark, it had broken in two. We waited a while, and the fog kind of lifted, and it shone through kind of a funnel, and it showed the Ark in the end. You could see in the end of it. And we saw both parts. You stand there with your mouth wide open. Ed Davis described three decks inside and large cages on the bottom deck, smaller cages on the second deck, and on the roof, a venting system with many holes on it and uh, so that you could see how the light and ventilation could go clear to the bottom deck. In this illustration, Alfred Lee has reconciled the two accounts the intact arc depicts George Agobian's sighting in 1906. Below are the two pieces as described by Ed Davis. However, Hagobian and Davis were unable to pinpoint the exact locations of the sightings, but their stories helped spark the interest of Don Shockey, an amateur archaeologist. I can't think of anything more exciting that I could be doing in my lifetime than having a small part in seeing this, whatever it is, verified. And we have good reason to believe it's, there's something there. We got it, we got to prove it. In 1989, Don Shockey launched an expedition to Mount Ararat. The mountain is on the easternmost edge of Turkey, bordered by Iran and the Georgia Democratic Republic, formerly a part of the Soviet Union. Shockey chose his destination based upon classified U.S. satellite photographs, which had been analyzed by an expert. For three days, Don Shockey and his guides made their way up the south side of the mountain. Our whole goal was to get to the spot over the top, down the glaciers to this particular location and verify what the satellite information had told us. However, the Turkish government restricts access to the north side of Mount Ararat. Foreigners are forbidden. One of the Turkish guides, Ahmet, continued on with camera in hand. Ahmet crested Mount Ararat and started down the north slope. At this point, at an elevation of nearly 16,000 feet, he spotted something half buried in the snow. From a distance of 300 yards, he took this photograph. 
which seems to show the end of a rectangular object with a peaked roof. He came back and I said, is anything showing? He said, a coop, a coop. And I said, what are you talking about, I met? A coop, a coop, like a chicken coop. Oh, it's kind of had a pointed top, and he said that you could see the outline of it in the side. He said, in all of my years, he had never seen anything like it. He said, there's some artifact there. Don Shockey believed that Ahmet might have discovered the remains of Noah's Ark. Shockey returned to the United States, where he took the photograph to forensic anthropologist Dr. Jim Ebert. It certainly does not look natural. It, it looks very strikingly man-made to me. Uh, of course, there are no scale cues uh, in here, so we can't really tell how big it is. What I see uh, when I look at this is something that stands out from the rest of the uh, terrain, and that is a, what looks like a solid uh, structure. You'll never know until you get up there and can see it and stand next to it. But it's the, the rectilinear outline suggests to me that this isn't a normal part of a glacier. In 1990, Shockey returned to Mount Ararat and undertook an extensive aerial search. Unfortunately, the site photographed by Ahmet had been completely covered with snow. Shockey was forced to abandon his effort, but remains convinced that he has probably found the resting place of Noah's Ark. Others disagree. We've been told for years that uh, Noah's Ark is on top of Mount Ararat because that's what the Bible says, and that's not what the Bible says. Uh, the Bible says the ark came to rest uh, on, upon the mountains of Ararat. That word is in the plural. And if we look David Bible, Fossil uh, is a former himself. merchant marine officer and merchant salvage expert who believes that the ark is buried beneath this unusual mound, a full 17 miles south of Mount Ararat. Fossil's team has made several expeditions to the area. They have combed the site with a metal detector discovered traces of iron beneath the mound, which do not appear to be natural deposits. Every 20 to 30 inches, uh, approximately, we have the remains of an iron fitting or an iron pin of sorts that are still there in the soil and discernible. Well, this is uh, one of uh, 5,400 iron fittings uh, that we've located. Of course, we haven't pulled them all out of the boat. Uh, it's, been, it's been cut in half by a diamond saw scanned by electron microscopes at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And um, this particular iron fitting is 94.84% uh, man-made wrought iron. Looking at the mound from above, the iron deposits form a distinct pattern of intersecting lines, which Fossil believes is a framework of the arc. From end to end, the lines measure 515 feet, or 300 cubits, the length of the ark as recorded in the Bible. The width averages 85 feet or 50 cubits, which also corresponds to the biblical dimension. Given the shape of the thing and the size of the thing and where, where they found it, I mean, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck until somebody finds something else, uh, what else could it possibly be but Noah's ark? Are the metal fittings the remnants of Noah's ark? Some have suggested that David Fossold has, in reality, found the remains of an ancient Mongol fort. Others say it is merely a geological formation. However, the Turkish government has declared the mound as the official site where Noah's Ark came to rest. The man who is in charge, Professor Sali Bayrak Tutan, uh, who is also a geologist, he says it's, it's Noah's Ark 200%. It is not a geological anatomy. It's a man-made structure. Has one of mankind's great mysteries finally been solved in this remote mountain range? It seems obvious that Don Shockey and David Fossold are both investigating something very unique. But only years of further exploration and detailed analysis will reveal exactly what they have found. It is tantalizing to think that Noah's Ark may actually exist. However unlikely it may seem, such a discovery would not be unprecedented. In fact, it was less than a hundred years ago that archaeologists uncovered the ruins of the ancient city of Troy, which had always been considered a myth. Finding Noah's Ark would no doubt prove more elusive. Perhaps it is a story best left as a metaphor, 
a cautionary tale for a world that has grown ever more complex and chaotic. Next, a young woman is found murdered in Louisiana. Perhaps you can help identify her killer. In November of 1988, 26-year-old Tracy Wofford Bunn began working as a waitress in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I think they keep coming back. Save me. She had arrived from Milwaukee, Wisconsin three months earlier, looking for a new start in a new city. Tracy was a beautiful person, outgoing, fun to be with. She would do things very spur of the moment. Uh, she could say, well, tomorrow I'm going to Minnesota. Tomorrow she'd go to Minnesota. Um, with no care whatsoever, wondering about what might happen, what would happen. No care. She knew where she was going. Tracy and Solomon Bunn had married in 1986. Two and a half years later, the marriage was on the skids, and Tracy turned to her younger sister, Danielle, who lived in Baton Rouge. She had spoken many times about leaving Milwaukee to sort of spread her wings and try something new. And so she just came to visit me, and we had a really good time. And I introduced her to quite a few different type people. And um, so she stayed with me, I think, a couple of weeks. And then she went back home and stayed about a week and a half and came back down with all of the rest of her stuff. Tracy settled in quickly. She landed a job and even found a new boyfriend. It seemed like life was starting all over again. Then six months later, on the morning of April 1st, 1989, it all came crashing down. Outside of an apartment complex, a passerby noticed a young woman apparently asleep in the front seat of a car. It quickly became obvious that the young woman was not asleep. Tracy Wofford Bunn had been murdered. About what time was it when you first saw the car? Uh, it was about 8 o'clock when I first saw the car. And when I came out, it was about 8.30 to really see what was, you know, was laid asleep or what in the car. Tracy had been raped and strangled to death. Oddly, investigators found no sign of a struggle. In fact, there were a number of things about the crime scene which did not seem quite right. Clothes are ruffled up and uh, her shoes are missing. Would you mind taking me a few shots of that? Upon examining uh, the body, we could see that the, the clothes were all jumbled up in a fashion that I have seen before. And it's usually when a person has had their clothing put back on them and, and they're either in an unconscious state or, 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 they're, or they're deceased. We also found that uh, the stick shift was broken off in the car. It's lying on the floorboard. I still believe the vehicle could have been driven, but it would have taken somebody with a little expertise at doing it to drive it with the stick shift broken off like that. The motive, the main thing that, I, that has me puzzled is uh, because there was no robbery. The jury was still on the victim, the purse was there, identification. This was just a total loss of life for no reason. With no physical evidence to go on, Detective Wheeler turned to the people who knew Tracy best. He started with her new boyfriend. We were together, and we just rode around for a little while. You were in Tracy's vehicle? Yes, yeah, we rode around. Well, when I spoke with the boyfriend, he advised me that about 4.30, March 31st, 1989, he dropped Tracy off at work, and he kept her vehicle. He and his cousin were riding around in the car, and uh, he was supposed to pick Tracy up that night at 12 midnight when she got off work. Oh, man! Unfortunately, he said the shift level broke off in the vehicle at Texas and East Polk. They parked the vehicle and went to uh, the cousin's house, which is about a half a mile away. Man, let's go ahead and leave it here. We'll come back and get it tomorrow. Let's walk on back to your house. Shit. Tracy's gonna be mad at me. Around midnight, Tracy called her boyfriend and learned that he had damaged the car. Come out of here, Timothy. She left work and walked to his cousin's house about a mile away. Yeah, you've been down. Spent some time in your own. Hey, you know, Eric? Uh, 
What happened to the car? It's, it broke. It's broken. How'd it break? I was just, Eric and I were just riding, right, Eric? And a whole shift just snapped off. A stick shift doesn't just snap off. Well, your shift just snapped. You know, all the problems you had getting it in the third gear, the shift this time just snapped off. I don't have any problems. You're the one causing the problems. OK, OK, true. Give me the keys. For what? So I can go get the car and take care of it. So what? Give me the keys. <laughs> Tracy walked a half mile to her car. Police estimate that she arrived around 12.30 a.m. We know she got to the vehicle because it was locked up by her boyfriend when he left it there. And when we found the vehicle that next morning, the keys were in the vehicle. But that is the last place that uh, we could positively say she was alive at when she arrived at the car. An hour and a half later, Tracy's car was driven to the apartment complex where she would be found murdered the next morning. I was advised by the uh, apartment manager that there was possibly a witness who saw the vehicle when it came into the parking lot around 1.30 a.m. and uh, saw somebody walk away from it and didn't pay any much attention to it. I feel that like Tracy Bond uh, was probably killed between the hours of 12.30 and 1.30 in the morning. Authorities are particularly disturbed by several unsettling details surrounding the murder. Not only had Tracy been raped and strangled, but there were second degree burns on her thighs and on the back of her hands. We haven't been able to determine what caused those burns. And uh, we've thought about every type of heating apparatus or device you could think of. We just can't find anything that would make that, that particular burn. We also don't understand the method of leaving the body the way it was. It was like they wanted this person to be found, and they wanted everybody to see. I don't know whether these guys were involved in drugs or not, but when you have a case involving people in narcotics, if you don't deal with them in the fashion that they want you to, they'll make an example out of you. I know someone personally that was um, very heavily involved in drugs. And he was, um, I guess he was trying to make some sort of drug transaction. And he was told that that person was the person who had murdered my sister. I think about a river. Man, I think one of those guys killed him, man. Hey, man, let's get out of here. Authorities did investigate a known drug dealer, but found no evidence linking him to the crime. It's my feeling that her boyfriend knew something because he had her car that night while she was at work. He didn't um, come and pick her up from work at the agreed upon time. Apparently when she went by his cousin's house to pick up the car, he told her that it was broken and that uh, you know you go on ahead and it doesn't sound like a likely story for a person who was supposed to be involved with my sister to just sort of throw her to the wolves at 12 or one o'clock at night. Tracy's boyfriend and his cousin were each given two polygraph examinations. They both passed the tests and are not considered suspects. I've worked a number of homicides, and uh, this one, I feel, has just a few pieces of the puzzle that haven't fell in place yet. And I, I know it's a solvable case. And it's frustrating for me, as well as for Tracy's family, to not know who these killers are because uh, we know they're walking around scot-free today, and, and Tracy's gone. It's, it's even now, it's hard to believe, even though I've seen her body, I've seen her, I've buried her, I've um, heard all this different information, all the, all the details and everything, and still, it's really difficult to believe, because I really don't know what happened. And I think if I knew what happened, I'd be able to, to believe that it's happened, and sort of leave it behind me.
when we return, the touching story of a man's search for his sister, a search which has spanned half a century. In 1941, Otumwa, Iowa, a family is about to be torn apart. Three brothers and a sister have been left in the care of their aunt, who, fearing for the children's well-being, has contacted the Child Welfare Department. Walter, Donald, Richard, Dolores, I need to take you to your new home now. Come out, please. You kids get on out here. We're going to take you to a decent home. Come on out. Walter, you're a big boy. Now you're going out to that car. Hurry up. Go on. At that time, there was four of us and another one on the way. And uh, I was just uh, probably about five and a half years old. I, I didn't know anything about adoptions or uh, stuff like that. And uh, I thought we would just go into this home and Later on, we was going to go back to Mama, say. Now, you just hush up and sit still. Sit still. Donald Strad's mother could do little to prevent the state from taking her children. She was pregnant with her fifth child and unable to work. A few months earlier, Donald's father had suffered a nervous breakdown and had been institutionalized. The children who ranged in age from two to nine years old were usually left to their own devices until the authorities stepped in. Two of the brothers were sent to Iowa State Youth Facilities. Donald and his sister, Dolores, were taken to a Lutheran children's home where they were placed in the care of the head nurse. You need to take a little rest. Dolores, here's your bottle. Let me try. Even though I wasn't the oldest boy, I was the babysitter and I played with my sister, and, and I enjoyed that. And I'd push her around on a tricycle and brush her hair and, and take care of her, you know. Uh, I always liked to help her, because she was my sister. Donald, here's some bananas. You feed it to your sister. Within days, Donald realized that he and his sister would not be going back to their mother. Donald cooperated with the nurse but was always alert for a chance to take his sister and escape. This nurse, basically, she was busy in the kitchen. She had her back turned to us, and, and I guess you might say she was intent on her job. And so uh, I just took my sister out the door right quiet, you know. <laughs> This was our chance to go home. And I sneaked her out the door and down the steps and out to this old model A forward. And uh, I opened it up and I helped her in on the floor and uh, helped her up on the seat. And I told her, now you sit right there because we're going home to see Mama. I didn't know anything about car, really, but I knew if you pushed that button down on the floor, that car would go. I'd uh, look out the window and hang on the steering wheel, and then I'd get down and push that button, that car would go ahead a little bit, you know, and then I'd get up and take another look, and I was trying to get this car down there on that main road. I didn't know which way I was going when I got there, but I knew that that road, I came in on it, and I needed to leave by it, you know. What do you think you're doing? Let go of me. I don't see my mama. You get out of that car right now. Don't you know you could kill somebody? The car door was just kind of just jerked open, right and now, she reached in and grabbed me up by the collar and went thrashing on me, you know, and, and I couldn't tell you today whether she whipped me with her hand or whether she had a board or whether she had a strap or, or anything, but uh, but I, I didn't, I knew she was whipping me, but I didn't feel no pain, and I was fighting her because I was wanting to go home. Donald, there's some cookies for you in the kitchen if you'd like them. Thank you. Two weeks later, unbeknownst to Donald, 
Dolores was adopted. Come on, baby. We're going to get you a new home. These people probably took Dolores away. I didn't know what, you know, what the deal was, but I thought, well, they, you know, they're going to bring her back here because uh, me and her was family, and, and that's all I had. I kept asking this woman, where's my sister? And, and uh, where's my sister? I want my sister, and, and she'd tell me, well, you just don't need to know. And uh, it ain't none of your business. And, uh, and stuff like that. And of course, I got unruly and laundry because I was wanting my sister. The separation was short-lived. Dolores' adoptive parents sent for Donald as soon as they realized that she was more than they could handle. Like the nurses at the home, they turned to Donald for help. Dolores wouldn't adjust to these folks or bond with these folks at first and uh, just cried and wanted her brother and, and stuff because, you know, we'd been together. And uh, these people were strangers to her. She just cried and wouldn't eat or whatever, and that's the reason they came and got me. So I could be a quieting factor, you might say. It's all right, baby. It's all right. <laughs> Under Donald's influence, Dolores began to adjust. Donald even stayed on for a few days, but was expected to remain well in the background. Okay, your turn. <laughs> These people got Dolores where she'd eat for them and uh, play with them, and, and uh, they treated her quite well, you know. And uh, I don't know, a day or two, whatever, this nurse come back and she said, uh, Donnie, you want to go downtown with me? I remember looking up, and uh, this woman was feeding my little sister, and uh, I thought, well, hey, everything's all right, you know? And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'd sure. like to go downtown, you know? I, I'm five and a half years old. I love to ride in automobiles, you know? Of course, I didn't realize this automobile was never going to bring me back. And uh, we got in the car, and we drove off, and I, I haven't seen my sister since. I think of Dolores, uh, you know, almost every day. She, she's still my sister, no matter, you know, what time is done. I want to try to catch up with 50 years of time somehow. But I'd like to hug her neck and tell her mister. Yeah. Donald Stratton and his two brothers, as well as another sister born after the family was split apart, were all reunited in 1965. Their father remained institutionalized for the rest of his life, and their mother was granted a divorce. Velma Strat remarried and had five more children. So now there are nine siblings, all looking for their lost sister, Dolores. Update. Just minutes after we first broadcast this story, a woman named Penelope Sue Lewis of Bolivar, Missouri, called our telecenter and identified herself as Donald Strat's long-lost sister. Donald was overjoyed to discover that Penelope lived just 50 miles from his home in Stoutland, Missouri. Three days later, at a park near Penelope's home, Donald, Penelope, and their extended families gathered for a heartwarming and long overdue reunion. Oh. Oh. God, it's been so many years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love her, I always have loved her. And uh, sometimes when I get along, get to think about it, I just sit down and cry. And uh, I don't mind crying this time because I'm already there. <laughs> yeah, already there. But I got another surprise for you. Yeah. Soon after Donald arrived, Penelope shared a poignant moment with her natural mother, Velma, whom she had not seen in more than 50 years. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh. Oh. I never thought I'd see this day. The reunion was a culmination of an emotional roller coaster ride, which had begun 72 hours earlier when Penelope sat down to watch Unsolved Mysteries. I try not to miss any, because I like to watch it, the reunions and things. And I thought, you know, I've always thought, well, maybe someday it'll be my turn. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, well, I, I, that's me, that's my family. <laughs> For Penelope, the gathering was also the chance to meet all the family members she never knew she had. One full sister, two half-sisters, three half-brothers, and countless nephews, nieces, and cousins. <laughs> we'll just probably try to get everybody acquainted with everybody and, and, and just go from there. Plan get together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I felt so helpless. Um, I felt like I didn't belong. And, and now I'm at peace. Next, a woman is brutally abducted from a car wash in Texas. Most of us never imagine that we will become part of an unsolved mystery, that we will suddenly hear a scream in the night and find ourselves involved in a criminal investigation. Yet that is exactly what happened to three young men in Austin, Texas on December 29, 1991, all because they happened to cross paths with a kidnapper. At 8.55 p.m., Steve Marks was on his way to meet his two brothers-in-law at a friend's house on Powell Street Less than a block from the house, he pulled behind a tan-colored car. That evening in question, I was driving down Powell Street, and I noticed a car in front of me driving very slowly. I followed it down the street, and I pulled in front of my friend's house. The car, in the meantime, had pulled up into the parking garage ahead of my friend's house and my brother-in-law's arrived about a minute later. Mike and Bill Goins had encountered the same car two blocks from the house going the wrong way on a one-way street. And when they stopped and we stopped, they looked at us like, what do we do next? And we looked at them like, okay, you fools, get out of the way. And that gave us an opportunity to see them, but Unfortunately, there was no reason for us to try to memorize their faces or anything. There was just two people passing in the night. At 9 p.m., Mike and Bill Goins rendezvoused with Steve Marks. The house where they met was just 200 feet from a 24-hour do-it-yourself car wash. I don't know. We were thinking about going out to eat. Well, we can go over to my house for some spaghetti. When we were on the porch, all we could see was the side of the car wash and the vacuum canisters uh, where cars are vacuumed outside of the stalls. So when we heard the scream and the car door or trunk slam, all we saw was the car pull out. As we saw the car pull out the wrong way on Fifth Street, I realized that that was the same car that I had pulled behind on Powell Street and that had made the U-turn in the parking garage. And the car that later Mike and Bill had said had confronted them going the wrong way on Powell Street, uh, pulling out onto 6th Street. A few seconds later, Steve Marks and Bill Goins arrived at the car wash. Unlike most nights, it was eerily deserted. We walked up to the car. We saw a purse, I see a purse the keys, still in there. and then Bill suggested I go back to okay. the house and call the police, because we figured something was wrong. The owner of the abandoned car was identified as 28-year-old Colleen Reed, a certified public accountant who had lived in Austin for four years. Police traced Colleen's movements on the day of the crime. She arrived at the car wash around 9, 10 p.m. 
Earlier that day, she had gone to church with her boyfriend. Then she spent several hours doing community volunteer work. That evening, Colleen went to the market and then withdrew cash from her bank machine before ending up at the car wash. Police believe that Colleen was kidnapped by the two men in the tan-colored vehicle. situation where after they had abducted Colleen Reed, they went the wrong way on Fifth Street and almost collided hit on with two vehicles. We have not heard from the drivers or the people that have occupied those two vehicles. So hopefully this show uh, will uh, maybe bring these two people forward that may have some information that will help us. I've almost convinced myself that we will someday see her again, that she's being held somewhere. And I know that that's what we want to believe. And the reality is that's probably not true, but there is a possibility. I think about when, when do I just say, okay, it's over, something happened, something horrible. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that. I've gone on with my life in a lot of ways. I'm, I work and take care of my children and do the things I need to do, but there's a, an empty place that I've had a hard time filling. Update, a suspect is in custody. Just last week, a man named Alva Hank Worley was arrested in Belton, Texas. He admitted involvement in the kidnapping, but denied knowing Colleen Reed's current whereabouts. However, Worley insisted that she was still alive the last time he saw her. Police are now looking for this man, Kenneth Allen McDuff. He is 46 years old six feet three inches tall and weighs 245 pounds. McDuff was last seen in Waco, Texas. Diabolical Mind, the very phrase evokes a chilling mystique. On Sunday, Unsolved Mysteries will present a special report, an exploration of the mysteries of the psychopath. What forces would transform this impoverished young boy into a ruthless dictator? Saddam Hussein's bloody and brutal rise to power was ignited by a single disturbing trait, a cunning mind unchecked by remorse or conscience. G. Daniel Walker has been convicted of crimes ranging from fraud to armed robbery to murder. In a remarkable interview, Walker provides a revealing glimpse into a diabolical mind. Violence, because fear lives with you 24 hours a day. Fear never goes away. If you kill somebody, that's over. When her husband and children fell victim to a series of mysterious illnesses, Marie Hilly was a devoted and caring wife and mother. In time, her son began to suspect the worst. His mother was poisoning her own family. The world as I knew it at that point just fell apart. Everything that my mother had taught me, right from wrong, I had to go back and re-examine. Join me Sunday night at 8 for this very special and very different edition of Unsolved Mysteries, Case Studies of the Diabolical Mind. Thank you.